Hi, everyone. Um, so the slot after lunch, huh? Um, <laughs> um, I, I'm here to sort of maybe energize you and wake you up and make you care about something that maybe you haven't cared about before. Um, and that's a tall order to ask in 15 minutes, so I hope you stick with me. My name is Sean, I go by Swix as well, um, and I work at Nellify as a developer experience engineer. Um, we care a lot about the future of the web, the trends that are going on, uh, as well as immutability. We think it's a fundamentally good um, engineering paradigm. So the first thing to ask about immutability in JavaScript is why. Because the, the classical reason you want immutability is because of thread safety in a multi-threaded environment. Um, you don't want things to lock up in, in, in segfault or whatever. Um, but JavaScript is single-threaded, so why even bother with immutability? Um, and to answer that, uh, I'm going to uh, go back in time for the, the people who are too young to be in this room. Um, <laughs> uh, on the left is a hard disk drive, um, and that's how we sort of used to store our data in, in computers. And on the right is a solid state drive, and that's what is in our laptops today and on our phones. We don't use uh, hard disk drives in our phones because they're too brittle. Um, and the reason that solid state drives are taking over is because of this uh, one industry metric we call mean time between failures, MTBF. Uh, the mean time, the rate of MTBFs of hard disk drives are is about 500,000 hours. And that's a manufacturer's guarantee. It actually is lower than that because that's reality. Um, and solid state drives go up to 2.5 million hours uh, mean time between failures. Um, so we have to think about like why that is. And that's fundamentally because of fewer moving parts. Um, they're, they're less breakable because there's less things to break. Um, the analogy to software is um, your software can be less breakable and more debuggable if you have fewer moving parts. So how can we lock down the things that should not be moving or, or change uh, uh, untowardly, I guess, is, 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 if that's the term. Um, uh, and before we get to immutability, you might ask, like, why not use any of the other tools available to us? So what about types? We can, we can use like, static types and, and checks and, and check against breaking. We can, we can test against things that are breaking. Uh, we can do a manual code review because that scales, right? Um, um, so the reason we want all of that is really to answer this fundamental question. So here I have a JavaScript function. Um, I have an object. Uh, it, it gets passed into a function, um, and then I have to do something with the object later on, like render it, log it out, whatever. Um, and the, the question is predicting what's in that object, uh, what's in the object after uh, passing it through. And you, you can't know unless you follow the rabbit trail all the way through uh, the source code of, t of uh, touch function down here. Um, and, and to rephrase it, uh, here's a simple test. Can I delete this? Um, I don't know. Um, and and, and that's, that's, a, that's a simple... Uh, test for like, can I refactor this? Can I can I insert a a, 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 a function around this? Can I can I move it around? Um, is it optimized for changed? Um, and and really, you want to prevent situations where you try to delete a block of code and um, everything just uh, falls apart. <laughs> um, and a lot of people. Uh, tend to talk about this as making code easier to reason about. Um, I don't like that because I can reason my way into a lot of unreasonable things. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I like to say make software explainable and not have us put in the same categories as UFOs. Um, so, <laughs> um, and, and, and so that's one pitch of immutability. Sorry about the, the burst. Um, the other pitch is performance. Um, when, so for example, I have an obj a nested object tree, for example, and I want to move a child of an object uh, from one node to another node. Um, that's a relatively simple operation in terms of like our mental model, but in terms of w how uh, computers recon reconcile this, it can be pretty complicated. Um, so to simplify this, because I don't have time, I made a meme for the millennials in the room. Um, full reconciliation, which is checking, checking things for change and iterating through and then checking where it might have moved or it may not have moved. That's an uh, O of n to the power of three operation. Uh, React takes a shortcut um, and cuts off any time it hits a node that has changed, it just re-renders the entire thing, in, including all its children. So that's an O of n operation. That's a big time saver. Um, but React plus immutable JS um, uh, cut, uh, knows that, for example, when siblings of, of children that have changed um, don't, don't re-render. So they, so they, they skip that uh, re-rendering. So that's an O of login operation. That's a longer discussion. I know we don't have time to get, get into it. Um, but that's why uh, Ohm, when it came out in, in 2013, um, React plus Ohm 
was faster than React itself. A wrapper library over React was faster than itself, and because it implemented uh, immutability. Uh, for more, you, can, you should definitely check out the canonical Immutable JS uh, presentation uh, at Facebook's uh, conference by Lee Byron. Um, highly recommended. Um, the library itself has reached 26,000 stars. It's got a couple million weekly downloads. Uh, certainly a very, very successful paradigm that uh, everyone should start thinking about. And we'll introduce, for, for people who are new to it, uh, the API. So here we have the same function that we introduced earlier. But I've wrapped my object in, some, in a function called immutable.map. And that gives me back a data structure called a map. To access that piece of data structure, I just call dot .get key. And, 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 I, and I have a guarantee, because these two things uh, are guaranteed to be immutable. Um, so that's great. I have a guarantee that it will never change. And no matter what, I, uh, I don't care about the touch function. I, I, can, I can just care about the code in front of me. I don't have to keep my entire code base in working memory. I just look at what's in front of me. Um, so uh, what if you have nested objects? So we have another API called get in, right? So, so we pass in an array of keys, and it just goes uh, indexes into it, in, into each one of them. Okay, what about um, checking for existence of a key? So we have has and has in. Um, and then what about uh, picking the first and last? Uh, don't ask me, like maps are unordered collections, so don't ask me what first and last mean. Um, and then we have a find and find key. Oh yeah, by the way, keys, values, and, and trees are uh, all slightly different things, so you should be aware of that. Oh, uh, and then, oh, okay, um, these are all helper <laughs> utility libraries for getting things, um, if you can remember them. Uh, well, let's, let, to do something interesting with programming, right? we should not only be reading stuff, we should also be setting stuff. Um, and here we have uh, the API for setting things. So we, have a, we're, we, have a, we declare an immutable map, uh, a nested object, and then we can set it deep inside the uh, immutable map. We have to assign it to a different variable because it's immutable, and now we can work with that O, o variable or, or the new one. So we have set and set in, of course. Um, of course, we should update as well and delete and clear, because clear is different from delete and four different kinds of merge. Um, so, so that's, um, uh, and this is, the, I actually made a wallpaper out of the, uh, the entire uh, API. Um, and there's all, there's all these kinds of functional utilities and conversion uh, utilities. Um, and the, be the really beautiful thing is this is just for the map uh, data structure. Um, there's also uh, a bunch of other, or this order map is set. Uh, there's a lot of different <laughs> data structures in Immutable. So you're getting a full featured experience with this. And the, the core question to ask instead of laughing at it is, is asking why Facebook um, needed this. Um, and the reason, it really is like you signed up for immutability, and then you got all this other stuff coming into your code base. Um, so that can be a little, you know, alarming. Um, but you have to really understand that the reason that they're going for this is persistent immutable data structures. They're solving problems that they have, um, and and. The data structures, in, in particular, is a try. Like a, it, they hash your, uh, your your object into a binary try, which is very efficient for lookup and, and retrieval and all that. Um, they also they also implement this thing called uh, structural sharing, where only the items that have changed um, uh, need to be changed, and then they they copy the references to to everything that has not been changed. So that's very that's very efficient uh, memory wise. <clears throat> And this, is, this reflects a general sort of programming paradigm where um, you should, for developer experience, you should try to um, make, you should try to let your, use, let your developer pretend as though everything is regenerated um, a, a fresh from, from beginning, um, like as a whole unit. And, uh, and, and, that's, and that's very easy to reason about. But for user experience, uh, for, for, uh, for speed and, and performance, you should want to cache and structurally share um, everything that's uh, of the previous versions. So this is a very familiar pattern. Uh, I call it the DX UX mullet, um, <laughs> which is um, immediate mode in front and retain mode in the back for those people with, familiar with graphics programming. Um, you want to have all the nice things in, in front and in, in a, in a thin layer, and then put all the ugly junk uh, in the back. And that's a very nice layer for uh, a, an API boundary for a library or a framework. Um, and you can see this in Git, where uh, Git, you, you, you're dealing with uh, the, the entire folder structure at the same time, but actually they're doing structural sharing uh, in the back. Uh, same with React, uh, and same with Netlify as well, the way we do uh, uh, immu immutable deploys um, and cache uh, your builds uh, in between builds. So 
every, every API also needs an escape hatch, and uh, immutable.js has a huge one. It's called 2.js, um, because it's, all, it's not a JS data structure, so you have to convert it to JS. Um, and, that's, uh, and using it, it's kind of an anti-pattern. Um, it, it basically opts you out of all the performance benefits, and that, that's creative immutable.js, Lee Byron, talking about this. And um, <clears throat> the problem is most people don't know how to deal with it. So uh, for example, here, if you console log an immutable object, you, you get all these um, uh, internals exposed to you in, in a console. So obviously people code extra browser extensions to help you cope with that. Um, and people code uh, uh, helper libraries to, to patch together with like Redux and, um, and Babel and, and, all, and all that. And all that. Uh, there's, like, there's, a, there's a library called React Router Redux Immutable um, to, just to you know, make sure your framework's extra tight. Um, so uh, in Nellify, we use Immutable.js. Uh, and I found that, so for example, if we import um, Immutable.js uh, 1x, um, we found that we were referencing that, uh, we were referencing immutable JS a APIs in 2x number of files and making 10x the number of calls. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an API that, that tends to spread among your code base because you're passing that data structure around and then you have to use uh, the methods that are blessed by that data structure. So in short, the problems with it are learning curve and interoperability. Um, and to, so to solve that or to, to have an alternative approach, I have to take a little detour uh, and talk about ES6 proxies. Um, and if you're not familiar with proxies, that's cool because you shouldn't be using them on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but proxies basically let you wrap um, collections, objects and arrays, and, and let you intercept and trap uh, events that are, that, are, that are happening to it. So here I've, I've wrapped a, a target variable and, I, and, it, and it outputs a wrapped target. Um, if, I, if I define a handler with a get function and it always returns 42, um, whenever I, whenever I uh, access any property of the wrap, wrap target, it's just gonna return 42 over here. Um, hopefully uh, the contrast is not too high on the screen, so uh, hopefully you can see what's going on. Um, so, <clears throat> so obviously like, that's, that's interesting, that's fun. Obviously 42 is the answer to everything. Uh, but uh, you, sh you, you can also uh, basically insert yourself into, uh, into anything uh, the object is doing. So here I'm, I'm returning what you're supposed to return when you, when you access a property. So both, both of these objects return bar. Uh, but in, inside it, I can, I can insert arbitrary logic like console logging or maybe saving it to a different variable. Um, and that's, that's some, kind of what I'm working up towards. Uh, so so I've, I have a get property and I'm, and I'm imitating uh, the, the underlying uh, behavior of the, the, the object that I'm wrapping. So there's an API for this, it's called reflect, uh, and reflect and proxy were designed together in, in ESX. So you can just reflect.get um, the, the behavior that is supposed to happen uh, in normal objects. Um, you can also, as well, if you have a getter, you also have a setter. Um, so you have a set, uh, set property, you can insert uh, arbitrary logic and you can reflect that uh, setter as well. So, all that background, um, if you took that and you wrap that into a function, and let's call this function produce, um, and that function, let's say, duplicates uh, a base object that you pass to it into, into something I'm, I'm gonna call new copy. You have the handler that we, that we defined before, but over here, instead of setting your, your base object, you just set uh, the new value on, on the copy of your object. Um, and, they, and it kind of starts to look like uh, immutability where you, you never touch your base object and you start to only modify your copy of the object and then you return the copy, especially if you freeze it at the end. Um, so all these new, uh, maybe sell, less used uh, functionality just to, just to create the experience of immutability. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. So uh, we can start using this API, uh, and this is the, uh, the API that, that, this is the function that we've just coded together. Um, this, this is a plain object, object, uh, foo bar, whatever. Uh, I'm gonna pass it into pro to, to the produce function, and I get back to draft. In this draft, I can mutate inside of this callback function any which way I like, and, it re and it's reflected in the, in, the, in the object that's returned. So here it's kind of beha it's, it's behaving the same way, and it's immutable. Um, and, and so this is a very different approach, I guess. It's kind of like a callback-based approach um, from immutable.js. And that's exactly, if you productionize this and write a whole bunch of uh, code we, I can't cover, um, that's actually the API of Immer, <coughs> uh, which, is, which is kind of the, the, the new library that, uh, that uh, came out a year ago. Um, so, so if you generalize that and make it available for objects and arrays, um, you can start doing things like this. I have an array of objects. Uh, I pass that in to the produce function, and now the, the, the draft I can get back, I can index, ooh, sorry. I can index into it with, with all the usual JavaScript. I don't need, uh, need 10,000 different getters and setters to do the stuff that I know how to do in JavaScript. Um, 
So I can push you know, new objects into the array. I can destructure from that. You can't do that in immutable JS. Um, so raw JavaScript APIs are powerful in and of itself if you can use it, and proxies uh, let you really do that um, by, in, by trapping and in, uh, in, injecting yourself into that process. Um, so the other, other cool things that Immer does, um, proxies don't uh, transpile back. Um, to ES5, so they have a fallback for that. Um, they also implement structural sharing. They're a quarter the size of Immer, um, and it could be smaller if they draw support for some things. They, they support currying, they support patching, um, and they have e equivalent performance to immutable JS. So uh, I just want to step back from this and just ask, like, why, what, why is immutability changing? What have we learned uh, from all of this? Um, and and, and the, the core answer, the core realization that people have gotten um, in the immutable community <laughs> is uh, immutability is not equal to, the, to persistent immutable data structures. Um, we wanted immutability. We were sold on immutable immutability. And we wanted, and we got immutable JS. Unfortunately, that was a bundle of a bunch of different things. There, there's immutability, but then there's also the persistent data structures. And then there's a, like this poor man's lodash um, that you can see with all the APIs and helper utilities. Um, and really what we want is, uh, what, what Immer came along and did was, all right, we'll keep the immutability, but instead of persistent immutable data structures, which uh, you, know, you, have, you take time to learn, we're just gonna use regular JavaScript objects and arrays. And instead of Lodash, you can, we would just use all the regular JavaScript stuff that you know how to do already. Um, Im immutable JS, by my account, has about 300 different APIs. Immer has one, uh, and you've already memorized it. So, um, so this is the, a chart of the adoption curve of Immer and Immutable JS. Um, you can see um, yeah, Immer has really taken off since October, November-ish. Um, and the other more interesting thing is maybe that uh, Immutable has stopped growing. Um, so, so obviously you shouldn't decide based on NPM charts, but uh, that's, that's a very interesting sort of rise and fall kind of story that, that, that it might, be, might be worth following, like this time next year. Uh, imagine where this might go. Um, and I want to step back from immutability and talk about general API design lessons and like what have we learned from, from, from this adventure. It's, it's been about three to four years of immutability in JavaScript. What can we learn from this? First is, if you're, if you're looking to contribute to open source and make your name, um, take something that people love um, and just make it less annoying. Um, so Danny Bramov did that with Create React App and, 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 and Flux. And, and, React, and then, and, and then Flux and Redux. Um, and obviously, Immer is in that same vein of like, it takes something that people, people use, but it's, it's super sort of leaky, um, and just make it, and tighten it up and make it, make it nice. Um, uh, the other thing is also having a small API is better than writing your own uh, DSL. Um, and I've, every time we talk about simplicity, we have to pray to the patron saint of simplicity, uh, Rich Hickey. <laughs> um, and scope is also very, very powerful. So one, way, one really powerful way to make sure that your API doesn't leak is that you only change the rules of what ha what's happening within the scope of, for example, a function. So, in, so inside this function, I can define whatever rules, for example, local mutability um, of, of my immutable object. But outside of it, everything's immutable. So that's, that's really great for reasoning about thinking about interoperating, uh, slow, uh, slowly, uh, transitioning or uh, adopt, uh, incremental adoption is, is the word I was looking for. Um, and, and, and you can apply this, you can see this happening in, in a bunch of other things. For example, React hooks and components where, uh, where, where uh, you, they, they definitely use scope to uh, contain themselves and make sure that they're backward compatible with all the other uh, components that are going on in React. Um, and the lastly, last thing to learn is to always bet on JavaScript. I, I, I thought this was a nice uh, thing to end on. Um, there's an asterisk over there. Uh, but basically, if, if you have, design, if you have uh, API design uh, questions sometimes, and you're thinking about ways to manipulate your, your data, um, always think about like, how can JavaScript do this, because it's the API that people already know. Um, so, so yeah, well, thank you for having me. That's, uh, my message is you may not need immutable JS. Thank you. <laughs>